Good evening, everyone. Um, gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. John Conte, who will be discussing with us the current status of the treatment of aortic valvular disease. Uh, Dr. Conte is an internationally recognized authority in the surgical treatment of congestive heart failure. Uh, he works from the Johns Hopkins Hospital, and under his leadership, that institution has developed one of the United States' leading programs in mechanical circulatory support. He led the Hopkins participation in all the major contemporary clinical studies of left ventricular assist devices and artificial hearts. He also developed the program in surgical ventricular restoration and remodeling, and the coronary artery surgery program in patients with significant post-infarction cardiac dysfunction. Dr. Conte is a graduate of Providence College and Georgetown University School of Medicine. He trained in general surgery at Georgetown and cardiac surgery at Stanford University. He joined the faculty of Johns Hopkins in 1998 from the University of Maryland, where he founded and led the heart and lung transplant programs from 1995 to 1998. He took over leadership of the heart transplantation program and directed that program for 12 years, also becoming the director of the lung transplant program. Dr. Conte's practice encompasses the full range of adult cardiac surgery with emphasis on minimally invasive mitral and aortic valvular surgery, as well as complex reoperative surgery. He has led the transcatheter aortic valve replacement program and has played a leading role in several major studies publishing extensively in this emerging field. The Hopkins program is one of the few in the United States with training programs for cardiac surgery and cardiac fellows in TAVR procedure and structural heart diseases. He's passionate about teaching. He's an active participant in the Hopkins Cardiac Society residency program and runs the Advanced Cardiac Surgery Fellowship. He developed the first cardiac surgery intensive care fellowship in the United States in 2008, actively involved in clinical and laboratory investigation through his entire career. In 2012, he founded the Maryland Cardiac Surgery Quality Initiative and serves as its president. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving Dr. John V. Conte a very warm welcome. Dr. Conte. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. I don't quite recognize the guy you were talking about, but, <clears throat> but I'd like to start off by thanking uh, the Cayman Heart Fund and the organizers of this meeting for the kind invitation. It's a, it's a pleasure to come down and to spend some time with you and your beautiful island, and uh, I'm greatly appreciative of the opportunity. Uh, what I'm gonna talk about this evening is something that I have really had a career uh, change in focus. For many, many years, I was like Dr. Sheffield up in the middle of the night and doing transplants and putting in heart pumps, and, and then I kind of saw the light, and I thought there was another way to be a heart surgeon and to, to still have fun, but to be able to sleep. And as you get a little older, you can all appreciate that. I don't see too many people in this room that are as old as I am, but I can tell you that uh, seeing Dr. Sheffield here this morning, I remember when he was an intern, and so if there's anything that makes you feel old, it's seeing that some of your former students and residents uh, have achieved national prominence like he has. But, uh, but I will move on and stop uh, geezing. That's what my daughters tell me when old folks start talking about the past, it's geezing. So I'll stop geezing and I'll talk about aortic valve disease for a while. <clears throat> Worldwide, the incidence of valvular heart disease is increasing to the point that 2.5% of the folks in the U.S. have some form of valvular heart disease. Now, part of that reason is because the population is aging, uh, and certainly as the population ages, there's more opportunity for uh, degenerative valve disease to uh, increase. But there's still a significant incidence of rheumatic heart disease, which has decreased over time, but certainly is still uh, prominent. And aortic stenosis is the most uh, common valve disease that we as surgeon and, and now cardiologists as well will intervene upon. Now, I try to keep it very simple. And really, when you talk about valvular heart disease, and particularly aortic valvular heart disease, there's only a couple of things that can happen. Number one, the valves can be tight, so it's hard to get blood out. Number two, the valves can leak, 
And so what gets out falls back in. And then three and four, with congenital heart defects and endocarditis, you can have either or both of those problems uh, existing in someone's valve. And if you look at this pie chart that uh, was published in the European Heart Journal a couple years ago, you can see, as I mentioned, that the incidence of degenerative heart disease is overwhelmingly the most common. Over 80% of all patients who have aortic stenosis have degenerative valve disease. And that's really a reflection of age as well as a few other risk factors such as hypertension and hypercholesterolemia. And if you look at some of the pathology there, uh, it's, it's interesting. This is really a, oops. This is a normal valve, and it's tri-leaflet, and it looks pretty uh, normal. Uh, it looks thin-walled. And then if you move over here and look at a bicuspid valve, this is a congenitally bicuspid valve. There's only two as opposed to three leaflets. And it becomes very, very calcified because of the abnormal velocities that result from having just two leaflets. Then you see what a valve looks like when you have rheumatic heart disease. And then this is a uh, degenerative valve, senile calcific uh, degeneration is really what happens. And what happens over time is as these pathologic changes occur, the openings of the valve go from three to four uh, centimeters per meter squared down to about one. And anything below one is considered severe, and anything below 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 centimeters squared is, is critical. So at that point in time, people tend to develop congestive heart failure amongst other symptoms. Now, degenerative calcific aortic stenosis, we mentioned, is really a disease of the elderly to the point that in the U.S., 2 to 7 percent of the population will have different uh, degrees of aortic stenosis. It's the third most common cardiovascular disease in the U.S. And if you look at bicuspid valves and rheumatic valvular disease, they're really diseases of younger patients. Nonetheless, it's the same pathophysiology. They develop aortic stenosis. Now, what is the natural history of aortic uh, stenosis? Well, it's a slowly progressive disease. You develop more symptoms as the valve openings become smaller, the velocities of the blood ejected become higher, and that's just a physical uh, representation of how tight the valve is. But over time, as that opening decreases and the heart function deteriorates, patients become clinically symptomatic, and the three most common symptoms that people develop with aortic stenosis are heart failure, which is really shortness of breath, syncope, which is passing out spells, and angina, which is heart pain, very similar to the pain that one might have with coronary disease. We also know that once you have developed high velocities, whether you're symptomatic or not, patient's mortality increases. And what this slide shows is that velocities that are very high, consistent with critical aortic stenosis, those that are high, consi uh, consistent with severe aortic stenosis, have decreased survival. So you can have patients that come to you who've had echocardiograms for whatever reason, who have high velocities, even if they tell you that, doctor, I feel good. They have a decreased life expectancy based on the mere fact that unknown to them and to their primary care givers or their cardiologists, that they have a limited life expectancy because of the damage that's being done to their heart muscle. So much like hypertension, unrecognized aortic stenosis can be a silent killer. Well, why do we operate? Well, it, it's quite simple. The reason we operate is because if you fix aortic stenosis, you can develop a life expectancy that's almost the same as someone who does not have aortic stenosis. And that's a very, very important uh, thing to consider when we think about the costs that we uh, spend in our healthcare systems. If you can put someone back on a normal life expectancy with a simple intervention, you've done a lot for that patient. Now, what are the treatment options? Well, we do a lot of valve repairs, but unfortunately not of the aortic valve. When we talk about the mitral valve or the tricuspid valve, repairing a valve is much better. 
because you really change the natural history of that disease. When we replace a valve, unfortunately, we're replacing one disease for another. You're really creating prosthetic heart valve disease, whether it's a mechanical valve or whether it's a tissue valve, you're giving the patient another disease that you have to treat them for. So it's important that we keep that in mind, but unfortunately, because of the calcific changes that you witness in those slides, you really have no choice but to cut out those valves and replace the valve, at least until recently, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Well, there's many different types of heart valves. There's mechanical valves, which were really the first types of heart valves that we were able to use to successfully treat patients back in the early 60s. And then after some fits and starts with tissue valves, really tissue valve replacement has become an effective therapy the later part of last century and certainly uh, in this century. These are some of the examples. This is an old uh, ball and cage valve that we really don't use anymore. But the way it would work is that as soon as the heart starts to eject, this little ball or poppet would be pushed out and the blood could get around. The problem is you still have that ball obstructing the orifice so it wasn't a perfect result. And there was still a high gradient. Now when you think about the openings that any of these mechanical valves uh, would, would represent, blood flow is much easier. And one of the things we know is that relief of the gradients, the degree of stenosis, plays a significant role in survival after valve replacement. So certainly the valve that allows the freest flow of blood at the lowest pressure will be the best for the patient. Well, if we look at tissue valves, there's a whole spectrum of tissue valves, and really they come from two main, three main sources. Uh, frozen human tissue, we call it a homograft, then there are bioprostheses made of either pig, heart valve tissue itself, or the pericardium of a pig or a cow, which are actually sewn. There's actually people that will take that tissue and sew it onto a uh, strut and create the valve. And here you can actually see in this valve the suture. So that's actually done by someone in a factory uh, to put these valves together. Now, like many things in life, there are people who think this is great and better than that, and really there's not a lot of short-term differences in survival. There are differences in how these valves are treated, but if you look at these, there are many types of tissue, many types of mechanical valves. There are many ways that these can be implanted, but all of them require open surgery, whether it's minimally invasive or regular traditional sternotomy where the entire breastbone is divided. They all require the heart-lung machine, and so they all require the bad things that are associated with cardiac surgery, if you think those things are bad, and I think most practitioners do. But there's lots of gray areas when discussing differences in mechanical valves versus tissue valves, and there's lots of misinformation that's out there. For example, when we talk about how long these valves should last, well, a mechanical valve is not going to wear out. The metal is not going to fatigue over time. It just hasn't happened. Now, can these valves fail? Sure, they can fail because humans are involved with these, and so patients may not take their medications as they're supposed to, and the blood thinner levels that they're supposed to maintain with these valves may not be kept up to where they should be. Well, tissue valves, they won't last forever. Well, some may. I just recently operated on a patient who had his tissue valve in for 29 years, and we left it alone because he had normal gradients, and when we re resected the aneurysm that he had, we left his valve alone. Uh, anticoagulation. Well, anticoagulation can be a problem. Certainly, it's an inconvenience. And when I was in training, we used to say that for every year you're on anticoagulation, you have a 1% chance of having a major bleed related to being on blood thinners. Well, that's a problem, but the trade-off between one operation for a valve versus multiple operations when a tissue valve wears off, you know, you have to take that into consideration. Well, no anticoagulation for a tissue valve, well, that's not exactly true because most of the time tissue valves are put in older patients and you all know that the people who tend to develop atrial fibrillation, it's not the 40-year-old guy, it's the patient who's 60 and 70 years of age so the worst situation is to be 72 years of age, 
with a deteriorated bioprosthesis on heparin, so you have the worst of both worlds. So a lot of things have to go into consideration when you're selecting a valve for a patient. Younger age, well, you shouldn't put a valve, a tissue valve in a young patient, you ought to have a mechanical valve. Or you shouldn't put a mechanical valve in an older patient. Well, earlier today I was talking <clears throat> to some medical students, I re recanted a patient I operated on this past uh, fall. And this is a patient in his late 40s who I was asked to do his fourth heart operation. His first heart operation was done when he was in his 20s. And I was very frank with him. I said, I think you're a nut if you want to have another tissue valve. And he said, Doc, I'll tell you what. You can make me give up sex. You can make me give up alcohol. I'll even quit smoking. But I am not going to quit up riding my motorcycle. And that's what this guy would have to do. He wouldn't be allowed to race motorcycles anymore. So for him, the best thing, at least he thought so, was to have a tissue valve. Now, I disagreed with him, but we did the operation that he wanted anyway. Uh, but, but there are very, very important reasons why some patients should avoid anticoagulation, if possible, and other patients, you know, I think it'd be beneficial. And while I'm not a zealot about anything, other than my dislike of the Pittsburgh Steelers <laughs> and a few other things, you know, I'm 56 years of age and I would have a mechanical valve with Coumadin tomorrow. I'll put that right out there because no matter how good Dr. Sheffield is or how good I am, there's teams of anesthesiologists and respiratory therapists and nurse practitioners and everybody involved in the healthcare system that have to do things perfectly to make a reoperation or a second reoperation or a third reoperation go well. Well, what does the literature show? I'm not going to show a lot of data here, but I want to show how the literature are like statistics. They're liars, and you can make of them what you want. I was going to say politicians, but we're entering a very uh, contentious political system in the US, so I'll avoid politicians. But <clears throat> if you go and look at some data, you'll see that when you compare survival with mechanical valves and survival with tissue valves, well, it sure looks like mechanical valves have an advantage. But when you go and look at who the patients are who have the tissue valves, well, they're a little bit older. And the mechanical valves, well, a little bit younger. So when you stratify these and match patients based on their risk factors, there's really not much difference. And so certainly for most patients that are of 60 years of, or older, it's probably a toss-up as to what valve is better for them. And you have to start looking at secondary things like quality of life, the need for reoperation, and the cost of what it's going to cost you and I and everyone who pays taxes who are going to be paying for these things. Well, how about minimally invasive? Everybody wants to do minimally invasive. No one wants to see Dr. Sheffield or myself because we put holes in people, right? That's what we do. And there are some options that are uh, emerging, but everybody wants to do things minimally invasively. And it's not just cardiac surgeons. It's general surgeons, it's urologists, anybody who can do things through a small incision is the one that people want to go to. Well, what defines minimally invasive? You know, for every paper I read or every conversation I have, people have their own definitions, and these are some of the factors that people look at to try and determine whether it's minimally invasive or not. But the reality is there are good reasons that you should try to make things smaller. You can decrease the pain. People get back to work sooner. And probably most importantly, patients want it. Patients will come and say, I want a minimally invasive operation, and if you don't do it, Dr. Sheffield, I'm going to Miami because it's only 20 minutes away or whatever. You get the point. So this is a patient I operated on, and he was very, very happy with his operation, and we went home. He had balloons and all that kind of stuff. Then he asked me a short time later, why didn't I get one of these? And he's right. Most people would prefer to have this operation than a full sternotomy because there's less disability and get back to full activities much sooner. Well, as it turns out, that guy was not a candidate because he had other things going on. But nonetheless, this is the typical operation or the typical scar that a patient would have on my routine aortic valve operation. 
There are the many different ways that we do uh, minimally invasive valve operations. And if you look, uh, this is a second inner space incision, and we can do it that way. Most commonly, however, we use a partial sternotomy to the upper part of the sternum. We can do it in the lower part of the sternum. And if you compare that with what it takes to get full exposure of the heart, there's a big difference. There really is. However, what's so different about it? Well, you know, the results are pretty controversial. There's a lot of papers out there that will give you conflicting uh, answers about what's the benefit. But it's really the same operation. We use the same tools for the most part as we do with open operations. So really, it's amount, the question boils down to, can the surgeon do it in you? There are certain conditions that would prohibit minimally invasive operations, primarily based on having poor heart function and the ability to protect the heart, or part of your anatomy. Have you had previous heart surgery with bypass grafts that might be uh, obstructing uh, the space behind the sternum? There's lots of little things that can go into it. But in fact, most patients are able to have minimally invasive operations, and most surgeons know how to do it because we do the same operation. Well, are there advantages? Yeah, there really are advantages. There's less blood loss. There's less time on the ventilators, by and large. You're back to work sooner. And in fact, it's cheaper. It's cheaper for the healthcare system, and it's cheaper for the economy. If you think the patient is back to work sooner, he's paying taxes again sooner, so there's lots of benefits in getting people back to full activity as soon as you can. Are they more difficult? Yeah, I'd say they are more difficult. But I think most surgeons can do that, and if you look around, you're gonna find more and more surgeons moving to straightforward, minimally invasive approaches than they would the traditional approaches. One of the new things out there, one of the sexy things, is sutureless valve replacements. Well, what is a sutureless valve replacement? Well, there are three uh, devices that have been in clinical trials throughout the world, and the basic premise of these sutureless valves is that the frames that these valves are uh, housed in, uh, this wire here and here that you can see most uh, obviously, the radial pressure that these uh, frames exert on the annulus of the aortic valve and the inside of the aorta holds the valve in place. So if you think about it, traditionally we go and we put sutures in. And that takes a while, and you have to tie the knots. And so I'll t walk you through what one of these operations would be, and you can kind of get the sense of how it has the potential of being much faster than a standard operation. So as a way of orienting you, the patient's feet are up here, the head's here. This is a standard operation that I do. It's a minimally invasive aortic valve operation. You can see the end of the sternum there. And the aorta has been arrested. Here's a, uh, the cannula here. And We've opened the aortic valve, or opened the aorta up, excuse me, and we cut out the valve. That's pretty straightforward. Same orientation for all of these. And now the valve is gone. The calcified valve, just like any one of those four pictures you saw before, is gone. And what we do is we have an area that we can put the valve in. So if we were gonna do a standard surgical valve, these are the sutures that we would put down in that hole. We'd put them through the soldering of the valve. We push the valve down to where it needs to be and we tie the knots. And all that takes some time. Sometimes more, sometimes less, but generally speaking, it takes at least a half hour of the act of putting the sutures in, putting the valve in place and tying the knots. Probably closer to 45 minutes uh, in most people's hands, but nonetheless, it takes time. So what happens now is this is a sutureless valve where we do put some guiding sutures in, but the valve is loaded on a delivery system. We will go and put the delivery system down into the opening that you saw, and then we deliver the valve by inserting some warm water on these valves. These valves are typically made of a metal called nitinol, which when warm, become very, very strong and hard, and when cooled, become very malleable, and that's how we're able to load it on the delivery system. So once we make the opening, we cut out the, the valve tissue, we lower this valve into place, we squirt a little warm saline on, and we're done, that's it. There's no sutures, 
There's no tying, and you save time. Now, if you think about patients who have poor cardiac function, patients who are having multiple procedures done, you can understand the importance of needing a quick operation, and this is certainly a tool that will help in higher risk patients who are either having bypasses as well, multiple valves, or just have poor heart function. It really is a nice option, and it makes minimally invasive surgery that much easier. And this is what they may look like when uh, they're implanted, and this is that same patient that I showed you before. This is the fully expanded, this is a pericardial valve, and this is what it looks like on echo. This is the mitral valve, the left atrium, left ventricle, and this is the bottom of the valve. You can see it right here, and it was a very quick, uh, easy operation. But what about transcatheter valves? We're hearing more and more about those, and who wants an incision, right? Who wants to have someone put a hole in their chest and divide their bone? I don't. But this is an option that's really come into play only recently. We're really just starting to fully understand the full benefit of what transcatheter valves are. And really, it was only uh, six years ago now that this paper came out that was the first prospective randomized trial to really look at whether these transcatheter valves are safe and effective therapies. And like most studies that are done, we compare a group of patients who are not candidates for standard therapy with those patients who are high risk for those therapies to see if there's a benefit. And if they're safe in people who have no other options, we then start to expand these uh, therapies for patients into patients who uh, are not the highest risk candidates. So the valve that was used in these first uh, studies was the, the uh, Sapien valve made by Edwards. And this is a pericardial valve made of the same tissue that Edwards uses for all of their pericardial valves. And it's mounted on a metal frame, just like the uh, individuals who sew the valves for the surgical valves. There are people who sew that and put it together. And on the back table, it's squeezed into a very small uh, catheter, which is about the size of maybe your pinky, or depending on your finger, uh, your ring finger. And then it's uh, delivered over a wire, and a balloon is blown up to deliver the valve where it needs to be. And that's done without an incision in most cases, but it does require having arteries that are large enough to handle that. And when this study came out, what it showed is that for people who have advanced heart failure, who had severe aortic stenosis, when you compared uh, patients in yellow who were not candidates for surgery at two years, two-thirds of those patients were dead. If you looked at a matched group of patients who were not candidates for regular surgery, who had a transcatheter valve, 40% of those patients were dead. So there was about a 25% increase in survival at two years for patients who underwent a non-operative or non-open surgical procedure to treat their aortic stenosis. Now, based on the success with this, another valve entered clinical trials in the US and throughout the world, and this was this, the core valve, which is a different type of valve for the same principle. Uh, it's a valve sewn on a frame, which is delivered through a catheter. Now, what I wanted to do uh, was to show you this video that the maker of the core valve device uh, puts out to educate people. And it really kind of shows you how both the Sapien valve, the balloon expandable, and the self-expanding valve works. What you have to do is you have to gain access to an artery that's large enough to accommodate the delivery system. And once the valve uh, gets into place, you either pull back a protective sheath that's keeping the valve uh, in a small state, or you blow up a balloon to expand the valve into position. So most patients that have the transcatheter valves require balloon valvuloplasty. At least the balloon expandable valves, it's required so that you can get the valve into place. So the first thing that happens is the balloon comes in, we pace the heart very, very quickly so that the heart is not ejecting, so you can hold the valve in the location you want it. And then what you'll see is the valve's now opening a little bit. 
This doesn't have to happen for the self-expanding valves, but oftentimes for very calcified valves, we'll do that. And so then the delivery system is put into place. Again, it goes over the same guide wire that the balloon was in from the femoral artery most of the time. And the, the uh, device is positioned. So this is the core valve device on a catheter with a sheath on it. Now, once this sheath is removed, the biological properties or the physiological properties of that metal valve will be to expand. This is a metal nitinol that wants to expand when it's at warm temperature and the body warms it up. So we'll get the valve into position. We'll use fluoroscopy to determine the right position. And then what we'll do is we'll pace the heart very quickly and we'll slowly pull back this sheath. And you see the valve now expanding because it's warm and this metal wants to expand. And the valve even starts working now before the valve's fully expanded. And if we're not happy with the position, we recapture it and take the valve out and we can reposition it. So every valve should be uh, positioned appropriately and that's it. The valve's in there and it's working. And that's a patient who otherwise would have had a big operation and a, a big incision and would spend a lot of time in the hospital. Well, the core valve study uh, compared both the extreme risk patients like you saw before with high risk patients. These are patients who were candidates for a regular operation, but they were higher risk than the average patient who undergoes aortic valve surgery. And after thorough screening, we have groups of patients who are very, very evenly matched. And what we found is that after two years, there was a very significant difference in survival. So if you're a patient who is high risk, and there's lots of ways that we look at patients to determine high risk, which is beyond the scope of this talk tonight, but high risk patients do better with the quintessential minimally invasive operation without an incision than they would if you had a standard valve replacement. And the results from these surgical valve replacements in this study were the best valve replacement outcomes in the history of mankind. So it really shows you that these patients do remarkably well with this technology, and you would expect that the difference in every place, in the average cardiac surgery center and the patients at the Cleveland Clinic and every place that's the best would do even better with minimally invasive transcatheter valve replacements. What this slide is used to show is that there are options for patients who don't have arteries in their groin that are large enough to have uh, the valves done that way. With the SAPI and the balloon expandable valve, you can go through the apex of the heart and we can do that through a two inch incision through the, the ribs on the left side. Or we can go through the subclavian artery or the, directly through the aorta using the core valve device. So in most of the large programs, mine would be one example, we can go and put a transcatheter valve in a number of ways even if patients have advanced vascular disease and don't have arteries that are large enough to have it put in. So many of those patients who were not seeking therapy in the past because they didn't want operations that were very invasive are candidates for either these limited incisions or these totally percutaneous approaches. One of the nice things that this technology has allowed us to do is to not have to replace degenerative valves, well, certainly degenerative tissue valves. And what you see here is a picture of a core valve device put in a standard tissue valve. So if this patient's tissue valve had become calcified, as many do, or the leaflets weren't working, we could go and replace that valve, often in that elderly patient who may not tolerate reoperative surgery because the risks are certainly much higher than primary operations. And so it offers us a new way to treat these patients. So what I want to do to finish up uh, this presentation tonight is to go through a few cases to show you how we can use this technology most effectively for patients who are high risk. So this first patient was an 84-year-old gentleman who'd had two previous bypass operations, had had a previous aortic valve operation, so now he comes to us for his fourth operation, who coming into this had renal insufficiency and COPD, not the type of patient you look forward to operating on. Well, what we can see here 
is you can see his sternotomy wires, the TE probe, and these are some of the vessel markers where we could see his previous uh, bypass grafts. And what we can see is the pigtail catheter that we use to do uh, aortograms, and you can see this valve is barely moving. What we do is we have the guide wire in there and the valve is uh, in position. And what you can see is these little ringlets here is at the tip of the three apices of this particular type of valve. What we've done is we've gone and started to uh, deploy the valve. You can see the opening here a little bit. And at this point, if we're not happy with the position, we resheath it and we reposition it. We're a little bit further in the process now. We have a little bit more shown and uh, we're looking at it. It looks pretty good. Now we're at the point where we're a little bit further. We've pulled the TE probe back and we're about to complete the deployment. Now what we do after these uh, valve deployments is we'll go and put a pigtail catheter across and we'll actually measure the pressures. That's the most accurate way of determining two things. Leaking after the, the uh, implantation because echocardiography, while a great screening tool, is not the most sensitive tool to determine if you have leaking. So we do precise measurements. And it also allows us to determine if there is a gradient across the valve. So by having the catheter in the ventricle, and in the ascending aorta, we can determine if there's a gradient. And if we're not happy, we can then go and uh, do something to treat that gradient. This is another patient who, as you can see, had previous surgery, has had previous PCI, and is, is extremely high risk. Let me go back. He has portal hypertension. He's got esophageal varices and uh, has advanced heart failure. So what we can see here similarly is we've gone and uh, done the transcatheter valve implantation. I've eliminated some of this, the video clips here, but it looks pretty good. But again, we have the catheter in here and we notice that the gradient was a little bit high. Now when we are uh, developed, we have no gradient between the ventricle and the aorta. With these valves, we shoot for a single digit gradient because certainly we're putting something inside the flow surface of the uh, aortic annulus, so there's gonna be some gradient, and we weren't quite happy. So what we did here was we put a balloon in and we expanded the valve. We did that so we could get full uh, expansion so that the uh, old valve is pushed aside, the leaflets of that valve are pushed aside, we measure the gradients again, and the gradients were single digit. And doing the aortogram, you can see there's no leaking whatsoever in this patient. Uh-oh. And then the uh, next patient I want to talk about was a young guy who unfortunately had endocarditis. He had been an IV drug abuser and had several uh, valve replacements. And the last replacement that he had done was a homograph, that's frozen human tissue. And the reason we do that is that's the least resistant artificial valve we have, uh, least resistant to infection. So regardless of age, if someone has an infection, we'll take uh, his valve out or the mechanical or tissue valve out and we'll replace it with a homograph. The bad thing about these tissues is they calcify and become uh, stenotic and uh, they also, the leaflet shrink, so you can develop a lot of aortic insufficiency. So it's the worst of both worlds. You become stenotic and insufficient at the same time. Well, I can tell you, having done a number of these explants, it's very, very difficult. You can see how calcified this is. This is his ascending aorta, and it's calcified. It's like an eggshell, and if you tried to clamp that, you would shower calcium throughout his circulatory system, and unfortunately, a lot of that would go to the brain. So in this patient, again, a different indication, someone who'd be very high risk, we wouldn't want to operate on, we go and put a uh, transcatheter valve in. And this patient did very, very well. As you can see, there's no leaking at all. This is the final deployment. And this patient, who would have had probably the most opera difficult operation that I could do 
ends up leaving the hospital in two days. And then finally, I want to show a case that uh, shows a couple of things. One, it shows how innovative people can use tools for uh, indications that they're not really meant for. So the FDA approves things for a specific indication. So these transcatheter valves were approved for aortic valve problems. Well, the patient that I'm going to show you about is a patient who had a very, very difficult heart operation. She had a tissue valve put in, but suffered a problem where her ventricle and her atria were separated. And the patient had horrible bleeding problems, was in the ICU, I'm told, for weeks. She had infections. She had to have her sternum uh, operated on multiple times. A year of antibiotics it was a horrible experience, and the patient was very high risk. Well, unfortunately, she developed a problem with her prosthetic valve and required this valve to be replaced because she had severe heart failure. Well, because of that difficulty she had with the first operation, we knew that operating on her would likely result in her death. So we appealed and got permission to use an aortic valve for her mitral valve. All we have to do is deliver it upside down. Sounds easy. Uh, and what we're going to show you is this is her bioprosthesis, which is torn. You can see that leaflet just flipping up into the left atrium. Here's the left atrium. Here's the left ventricle. Here's her aortic valve. And you can see on echo, this color represents all the leaking of the valve. You can see without color and with color, it's a bad problem. So here we are through the apex of her heart. We've done a small thoracotomy through the apex of her heart. And this is the valve folded up on the catheter. The balloon has not been expanded yet. And now you can see how calcified her own uh, tissue is, and you can see the leaflets of the other valve. But you can see the problem. Here we are expanding the, the valve inside her mitral valve. We've expanded that. The valve's deployed there, and this is what it looks like. This is the valve moving inside the old valve, no leaking whatsoever, and the lady has done fabulously well. So in conclusion, aortic valve disease is a uh, very treatable condition. Patients should do very, very well, whether they're treated with open surgery or with minimally invasive surgical techniques, and they should do very, very well if they're treated with transcatheter techniques. The surgical approaches historically are the standard, but transcatheter valves are increasing in frequency both throughout the world and in the United States. In Germany, about 60% of the valves that are put in now are put in transcatheter. Now, there's lots of arguments about what's appropriate. These valves are more expensive, but you may make up the cost with shorter hospitalizations, less but different complications. Uh, so there's lots to remain in the discussion and the approval to put these valves in uh, different populations of patients. And there's no free lunch. Just because you have this done now, that doesn't mean you're not going to have problems that need reoperation in the future. And reoperating on these valves is logarithmically higher and more difficult than taking out a standard valve. So in Many, many ways, it's kind of like the U.S. deficit. You're just pushing the problem down the road by putting in a transcatheter valve. So we have to make these decisions judiciously and with a lot of thought. But it may allow us to use bioprosthetic valves earlier in patients who truly need bioprosthetic valves who can't take anticoagulation. Uh, it's particularly beneficial for reoperative situations. But again, you have to consider everything, and a case-by-case -case determination really needs to be made. Uh, and I will end at this point. Again, I thank uh, the Cayman Heart Fund. I thank the sponsors for the kind invitation to come and spend some time with you. Thank you. Hey, John, you've, you've talked quite a lot about uh, treating this, the degenerative calcific aortic valve. Uh, but we also see the patients, say, with bicuspid valve that have primarily aortic insufficiency. Now, how, where, where do we stand in terms of doing uh, transcatheter techniques for valves that are not calcified but are leaking? Yeah, great question. We've done that uh, a couple times. The, the FDA has not approved that yet, but it will happen. Uh, now, the issue that 
figures into approval or not approval for this. It's not that insufficient valves don't need valve replacement. The problem is the calcified valve leaflets, the calcified annulus, provide sturdy structures against which these cages can bite into and hold on to. If you don't have strong tissue upon which these uh, frames can exert radial force, the valves are potentially not going to hold into place. So certainly that's an issue with non-calcified valves. With bicuspid valves, it's a little bit different. Even calcified bicuspid valves are more difficult to treat, again, because you have to have full expansion for these valves to work well, and it's harder for them to form a seal because if you can't get full expansion of the frame, you're gonna have a lot of aortic insufficiency. And whether it's a surgical valve or whether it's a transcatheter valve, if you have aortic insufficiency, you're at much higher risk for uh, not surviving, even mild degrees of aortic insufficiency. So certainly those are things that we're working on and we'll slowly do more and more. But uh, for right now, the FDA has only chosen to approve these uh, for, for calcified valves, and over time, I'm sure these other indications will follow. How far are we uh, to see the, the, the transvalvular trans, uh, uh, tower as a standard type of uh, treatment for aortic stenosis? Well, it is standard treatment for older patients for, 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 and for, for higher everyone. risk patients. But again, the problem, and, and the FDA moves much slower than other uh, agencies throughout the world in approving devices, and they, they need to be. These valves work wonderfully. There's no indication that they wear out any quicker than a standard bioprosthesis. However, they're going to wear out at some point in time. And when you wear out a valve, like if you imagine that core valve uh, big frame, you're going to have to do a root replacement, which is going to involve excising the base of the heart taking the coronary arteries off and then re-implanting it on a, on a graft. And that's a big operation. Now, I may do that fairly frequently at a large center, but the average patient is not going to have access to that type of therapy for the next operation. So you have to take everything into consideration. Certainly for higher risk and elderly patients, this is the way to go. But it's not necessarily the way to go for younger, more healthy patients and as someone at a training institution, I think about this, how am I going to train the next generation of surgeons? If we're going and taking away routine aortic valve operations, who's going to be there to take care of the complication of a transcatheter valve down the road? You know, I'm kind of worried. I'm 56. I got to make sure that for at least 30 or 40 years there's someone who can take care of me. I don't care about your kids, grandkids, and so forth. I got 30 years left in this baby. No, I'm only kidding. 